Oh, hello. You must be here for the great tech sour. Come on in. Hello class, sorry I couldn't be with you today to talk to you about one of our semester's most intriguing authors, St. Thomas More and his book Utopia. Before we get into the book, I just wanted to say a few things about Thomas More. Here is a picture of Thomas More. This is the famous patron pa painting or portrait by Holbein. It's kind of hard to see with the glare. But he's wearing the robes of the Chancellor of England, an extremely important position. He was kind of King Henry VIII's right-hand man. And he was one of the leading Renaissance humanists of the day. We have now entered into the end of the Middle Ages and the beginning of the Renaissance. And as you may know, the Renaissance means rebirth. But rebirth of what? Um, it actually referred to a rebirth of some of the arts and sciences that had been around in Greek and Roman antiquity but weren't popular during the Middle Ages. It's not the case, though, that obvious that pagan learning or classical learning was dead during the Middle Ages. You read St. Thomas Aquinas. You read Dante. You know that these guys were engaging the ancient world in a very sophisticated way. But the Renaissance brought some new things that had been neglected. For example, the study of Greek. Uh, the Latin West knew Latin, but they didn't know Greek. Aquinas had to um, read Aristotle in translation. Moore was part of a generation of what were called Renaissance humanists that tried to change that. Uh, Moore was a graduate of Oxford University. He petitioned his alma mater, hey, why don't you guys actually teach Greek? Moore himself basically taught himself Greek to do one thing, to read a platonic dialogue. So uh, he was a very impressive intellectual. He uh, entered into uh, uh, the career of a lawyer. He was actually England's most successful and wealthiest lawyer. And there was one reason why. He was renowned for his honesty and integrity. And so people flocked to him for a fair deal, which Moore gave them. So he was successful in his craft. He, um, he was very interested in political philosophy, which is why he learned Greek to learn Plato. And um, he eventually took a job for King Henry VIII, who asked him to become his chancellor. He actually had to take a pay cut in order to accept the job. He was making more in private practice. But he had a sense of civic mindedness. He had a sense of duty to his country, so he accepted it. And everything went well until Henry VIII, unable to conceive a male child, decided to divorce his wife, Catherine of Aragon, and marry Anne Boleyn. Uh, of course, there is no such thing as divorce in the Catholic Church. He asked the Pope permission to do so. The Pope said, no, that's not what we do. Henry got furious, and he broke with Rome and declared himself head of the Church of England, uh, thereby creating the Church of England, the Anglican Church. Um, Moore was a devout Catholic, and he thought, no, I don't want to go along with this. But he didn't want to publicly protest the king's decision either. So what he decided to do was resign quietly and hope that it would all blow over. Um, well, it didn't. Uh, there's a great movie about Thomas More. I highly recommend it, called A Man for All Seasons. And there is a scene in there where two of the king's aides are talking to each other and one of the aides says to the other what's the big deal he's he's keeping silent 
he, he's not publicly protesting Henry's decision. And the other guy replied, you fool, his silence can be heard all over England. When the country's most honest man won't say a word in favor of what the king is doing, it looks really, really bad. So they pressured him and they tried to get him to sign an oath of supremacy, recognizing Henry VIII as the head of the Church of England. And Moore could not in good conscience do so. So he was basically given a kind of a kangaroo court trial and he was found guilty of high treason. He was, uh, for which the sentence was to be uh, hanged, drawn, and quartered, which is a really gruesome way to go. And the night before he was to receive this execution, Henry commuted the sentence to a beheading in honor of their old friendship, which may not seem like a very honorable thing to do, but it actually does be being hanged, drawn, and quartered. So, uh, Moore had, as you will see from Utopia, that's my wife in the background. Say hi, Alexandra. Hi, everybody. <laughs> um, Moore had a wonderful sense of humor, and um, you see this in Utopia, for example, and he kept it to his dying day when he was, he was locked up in the Tower of London for a number of years, and he had grown a long beard, and when he put his head on the chopping block, he said, may I remove my beard from the chopping block for it has not been condemned for high treason. And his final words were, I die the king's good servant and God's first. That's usually misquoted. When you look this up online or someplace else, they'll, they'll always have, I die the king's good servant but God's first. But he didn't say but, he said and. And note the difference, note the difference that one word can make. But implies a conflict between serving the king and serving God. And that if in this conflict he chooses to serve God rather than the king. That does make sense in the context, but again, that's not what he said. He doesn't see a conflict. He sees serving God as a way of serving the king and vice versa. He was still serving the king even when he was disagreeing with the king. By serving God, he made a better servant to the king. He offered better witness to the king, better counsel to the king, a better example to the king. It's unfortunate that the king, Henry VIII, did not listen. Um, but it doesn't mean that Moore was a bad servant. Even in breaking rank from Henry, he was showing what a good servant of the king he was, rather than just being some kind of, uh, you know, unhelpful yes man. So Moore uh, dies uh, for his conscience. Uh, he is canonized a saint by the Catholic Church, but not until 1935. Moore was executed July 6, 1535. It took 400 years for the Catholic Church to recognize him as a saint. And there are two interesting reasons why. Number one is they didn't want to canonize Thomas More because the Catholic Church was holding out hope that they could somehow reconcile with the Church of England. So they didn't want to like kind of stir up the pot by canonizing someone that the, the Church of England uh, had somehow been responsible for his, his martyrdom. So, but then after 400 years, they kind of realized, eh, it's this, this rapprochement isn't quite happening, so we might as well canonize him. But the second more immediate reason was the climate in Europe at the time. What was happening in 1935? It was the rise of totalitarian powers. You had the rise of fascism in several countries in Europe, Italy and Spain and Germany. You had the rise of communism in the Soviet Union. This was the rise of these enormously powerful atheistic dictatorships. And Pius XI, the Pope at the time, was worried about this. And he, he raised Thomas More to the altars to uh, give an example of civil disobedience. 
this is the kind of witness to your conscience that you should give when you are um, in the face of in the face of tyranny. Oh, and just one other biographical note about Thomas More. So he's declared a saint by the Catholic Church in uh, 1935. What's interesting is that in 1999, he was also recognized as a saint by the Church of England. They added St. Thomas More's feast day to the Anglican calendar in 1999, thereby recognizing him as a saint. So in some respects, this is testimony to the valuable witness of uh, conscience and integrity that uh, More stands for. As a matter of fact, it's kind of appropriate, but Thomas More is the guy who actually gave us the modern meaning of the word integrity. Before that, it just meant whole. Like in, in mathematics, uh, a, an integer is a whole number. He was the first guy to apply that morally. A human being, a, a moral human being, is a human being that is whole, that has integrity. He's not divided and duplicitous. He is one. So Moore is a fascinating character. But in 1515, none of the things that for which he would later become famous were around. In 1515, he wrote a book called Utopia. And he was taking advantage of the new Renaissance learning of the day. It was written in Latin. Uh, Moore was an outstanding Latinist. Uh, the Latin is so good that he actually has different kinds of Latin for the two different characters in the story. Uh, Morris, which is Thomas More, and uh, Ra Raphael Hithliday. Uh, More, when he wrote Utopia, had not accepted the job for Henry VIII, but he had been offered the job. He was doing some light diplomatic work for the crown in Holland when he decided to write this. And then he got the serious offer to become uh, the, the Chancellor of England. And so, this is, when, when Moore and Hithliday are debating in Book 1 about whether someone who loves wisdom should enter into the service of the king, uh, that wasn't an academic question for Thomas More. He was debating that very question about himself when he wrote the book. And of course, we all know how the story ended. He ends up dying. He ends up being executed for his service to the king. Uh, so that as an extra sort of twist, which of course he and nobody else was aware of at the time. Moore is the guy who coined the word utopia. He certainly did not begin the genre of utopian literature. Plato's Republic uh, would be a good first start of utopian literature. We saw that Dante's comedy has utopian elements with Paradiso. Um, but he's the first to coin the word, and it was rather ingenious. He's taking advantage of this new love of Greek. And so he took the Greek word, to, um, topos is the Greek word for place, so he used topia as a derivation of the word place, and then he puts u right there. Now, the letter U in Greek by itself means nothing. But if you add an epsilon, it becomes eutopia, which means beautiful place, good place. But if you add an omicron in front of the U, the upsilon, it becomes utopia, which means no place. U is the word for not. So the question is, which one is it? Is it is utopia no place, or is it the good place? And the answer is yes. It's both. And that is, of course, the classical tradition of utopia. It is uh, the good place is no place. The perfect place will never, ever exist. As Plato concludes in the Republic, the just city will only exist in speech. And so we talked a little about this before with Dante. So this still is very much in the classical tradition of utopia, 
as opposed to the more modern ideas of utopia, which actually do expect the good place to become a reality. And they're willing to commit all kinds of corruption and injustice uh, in the name of making this utopian uh, dream a reality. But you can see where Moore uh, plays off of both senses of the word at the very beginning with the, uh, his, his title page, which isn't numbered, but you can see right here at the beginning of the book. And there's supposed to be a little poem on the island of Utopia by the poet laureate Animolius. Moore uses a lot of Greek names in this book. So the book's written in Latin, but a lot of the names are in Greek, and the names are all jokes. So the poet laureate's name in Greek means windbag. And the river means, uh, the name for the river is no water. So he, he put all these little jokes in there as a clue so that people would know that this was all a fictitious account. Remember, he's writing this in 1515. The new world has just been discovered. We know there's a whole new continent out there, maybe another hemisphere, but at that time, Europeans knew so little about what was out there. And so when Moore sets this utopian place in an island in the Atlantic, people didn't know that this was a joke. Uh, so he put in these little jokes so that they would know that it was a joke. The problem is Moore was ahead of his time and a lot of his readers even if they knew Latin, they didn't know Greek, and so they didn't get the joke, and they actually thought Utopia was, was real. Well, let's go back to that. Uh, oh, sorry, hold on a sec. Let's go back to that little poem by Windbag. Called, one, called once no place, because I stood apart, now I compare with Plato's state perhaps surpass it. What he only wrote about, I have alone in fact become. The best in people, wealth, in laws, by far the best. Good place, by rights, I should be called. Notice Moore's dry sense of humor. He argues that his utopia is better than Plato's Republic. For one reason, it actually exists. But of course, it does not. So, why did he write this? He knows that it is no place, but it's also supposed to be an ideal. What is the purpose of utopia? Um, I don't know. I can tell you, though, that there are a couple of clues that he has left. One of them is that we, can on, we only rely on the word of one man, Raphael Hithliday. And as I've suggested, the names in Utopia are significant. Uh, Raphael Hithliday, two names. Raphael is Hebrew for medicine of God. Hithliday is a word that Moore coined. It literally means peddler of nonsense. So, the question is, what is utopia? Is it medicine or is it nonsense? And the answer is yes. Could it be both? You didn't have to read this, but I want you to look at it now. Go to page 138. There are several letters that are attached to this volume. This is a letter from Thomas More to his friend Peter Giles after the publication of Utopia. And it's a hilarious letter because More is saying to Giles, you know there are some people who are accusing me of making this stuff up? Can you believe that? And notice what he says on the, the bottom paragraph of 138. But when he is in doubt, whether the work is true or fictitious. On this point, I think his own usual good judgment is lacking. Nevertheless, 
I do not deny that if I had decided to write about the Commonwealth and a story such as this had occurred to me, I would not have shrunk from a fictional presentation which would make the truth slip more pleasantly into the mind like medicine smeared with honey. Remember the old phrase, or the old song, just a teaspoon of sugar helps the medicine go down? Why do we need a teaspoon of sugar to make the medicine go down? Because the medicine is bitter. The truth is bitter. People don't like the truth because the truth tastes bitter. And so to give them unadulterated truth will only make them angry at you. And so what do you got to do? You've got to smear it with honey. You've got to smear it with nonsense in order for them to take the medicine. Moore continues, but certainly, so he's denying, I wouldn't have written a fictitious thing, but if I'd wanted to write a fictitious thing, I would have managed it so that, even though I might have wanted to deceive the ignorant mob, I would at least have inserted some pointed hints which would have let the more learned discover what I was about. Sound familiar? Remember how Averroes describes things? Thus, even if I had done nothing more than assign to the ruler, river, city, and island such names as would have informed learned readers that the island is nowhere, the city is a phantom, the river has no water, the ruler no people, which would not have been hard to do and would have been much more elegant than what I actually did. For if I had not been forced by historical accuracy, I am not so stupid as to use those barbarous and meaningless names Utopia, Anider, Amorot, and Adamus. He had a very dry sense of humor, Thomas More. And don't worry, he's not a Latin of Aroist. Uh, the very fact that he's telling you he's doing this is proof that he's not. Uh, he would have kept his cards closer to the vest had he done so. So he, But he clearly is telling us, look, uh, you need to scratch the surface of things in order to understand what's going on in this book. This, uh, and, and the reason why is I can't give you the truth in an unadulterated way because most audiences simply aren't interested in the truth. It's, it's a sad commentary on human nature, but there it is. And so, somehow, we have to figure out how is this nonsense medicinal? It is both medicinal and it's nonsense. How? How is the nonsense helping us heal? Helping us become wiser? That will be the challenge of reading book two. But before we get to book two, which we'll be doing obviously next class, we need to understand why he set things up with book one. Book one gives us uh, Moore's answer to the question, how and why people are so resistant to the truth. And you see this take shape in the, in the debate between Hithliday and Thomas More. Thomas More, the character that is, is optimistic. Of course, uh, wise people should enter into the service of the king. Whereas Hithliday, like, nope, nope, not at all. No, no deal whatsoever. And he gives an example, his time at this cardinal's uh, dinner. And the cardinal was a good guy. Thomas More actually knew him in real life. But the guy was surrounded by bootlickers, by sycophants. And so the Cardinal was never able to get good counsel because of these people who are only interested in power surrounding him and telling him what he wanted to hear. And Hithliday tries to speak the truth and everyone else gets upset. So even if you find like a good prince, a good ruler who's interested in uh, truth and wisdom, uh, it's going to be very hard to find other people surrounding him like that because they're there only because they're attracted 
to power. So Hithlidae says, nope, I'm not going to do it. And so they have a remarkable conversation on page 83 and 84. Oh, I'm sorry, not 83, 84, 60. Yeah, hold on, let me find it for you. All right, I got it. Page 43. So, Hitler has just been going on and on. I know what's wrong with Europe. Their laws are ridiculous, blah, 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 blah. Uh, and it's true, Moore agrees. There were problems with the laws of England at the time. For example... If you stole a loaf of bread, the punishment was death. That seems pretty harsh. Now, you also have to understand that a loaf of bread at the time could feed an entire family. So it wasn't as insignificant as it is today, but still, that's pretty harsh. Thomas More's a lawyer. He agrees. The laws of England need help. But Hifiday's weird. A lot of his solutions, it seems like the cure is often worse than the disease. He has weird ideas about enslaving uh, those who are caught stealing and clipping their ears and just, he's kind of a weird dude. And so he's going on and on and on. And so finally Thomas More, the character says, gosh, you're so smart. Maybe you should enter into public service. And Hifliday says, no, no, that's ridiculous. And so he says, has a very famous statement in the middle of page 43. That is what I said, Hifliday replied. Among princes, there is no room for philosophy. Notice this is a reformulation of the, uh, the, the theme of the Republic. Can there be a philosopher king? Can there be a wedding of wisdom and power? Can the love of truth and political power ever fully unite? And the classical answer is... Not really. So that's where Hitler is coming in. I was like, nope. There can never be any room for philosophy among princes. Thomas More, the character, disagrees. Yes, indeed, there is. But not for this academic philosophy of yours, which considers anything appropriate anywhere. The problem with Hitler, More says, is that he's like a bull in a china shop. He doesn't take into account the situation. He just kind of comes in and pontificates. And that, of course that's going to turn people off. It's, it's arrogant. It's imprudent. Moore recommends something else. What he basically recommends is political philosophy, which is not just philosophizing about the political. It's knowing how to philosophize in a political situation. Notice what he says. There is another sort of philosophy, better suited to public affairs. It knows its role and adapts to it, keeping to its part in the play at hand with harmony and decorum. This is the sort you should use. Otherwise, during a performance of a comedy by Plautus, when the slaves are joking around together, if you should come out onto the stage dressed like a philosopher and recite the passage from Octavia where Seneca argues with Nero, which is tragedy, by the way, not a comedy, wouldn't it have been better for you to have a non-speaking part than to jumble together tragedy and comedy by reciting something inappropriate? By hauling in something quite diverse, you would spoil and distort the play then being presented, even if what you add were better in itself. Whatever play is being presented... Play your part as best you can, and do not disturb the whole performance just because a more elegant play by someone else comes to mind. Play the role you're given. Don't try to remake the role. Play the role to the best of your ability. More continues. That's how it is in the Commonwealth. That's how it is in the councils of princes. If you cannot thoroughly eradicate corrupt opinions or cure long-standing evils to your own satisfaction, that is still no reason to abandon the commonwealth. Deserting the ship in a storm 
because you cannot control the winds. You should not din into people's ears odd and peculiar language, which you know will have no effect on those who believe otherwise. But rather, by indirection, you should strive and struggle as hard as you can to handle everything deftly. And if you cannot turn something to good, at least make it as little bad as you can. For everything will not be done well until all men are good. And I do not expect to see that for quite a few years yet. Strive by indirection to handle everything deftly. Don't come in like a bull in a china shop. Be subtle, be diplomatic, be prudent. Hithloday is not impressed. He says two things in response to Moore's argument. Number one, if I did what you said, I would only be confirming madmen in their madness. If I used indirection, they'd never pick up on the clue, and they would just continue being fools. Number two, what you're asking me to do sounds a lot like lying, and lying is against the gospel. As a Christian, I cannot lie. And so book one kind of ends with a standoff. Moore makes some very good points, but so does Hithliday. So what is the resolution to the standoff in book one? Is it not book two? Think about it. This fictitious account of a perfect island somewhere way off in the Western Atlantic can, it fulfills all the conditions of both Moore and Hithliday. It does not communicate the truth in a direct confrontational manner, but rather hides it in all kinds of bizarre ways. So it's using indirection. But as you will see when you read book two, it doesn't confirm any madmen in their madness because it is so bizarre. It is so bizarre that you'll read one thing that you like and then read the very next sentence will be something outrageous. Moore is constantly throwing you off your balance. And it's not a lie. Remember, a lie is a falsehood told with the intention to deceive. Fiction is a falsehood. But it's not a falsehood told with the intention to deceive. It's told with the intention to entertain or maybe educate. So it's not a lie. It, it doesn't contradict the gospel's prohibition against lying. So this fulfills all the conditions of Moore and Hifliday's uh, uh, ideas. So I want you to read book two for Tuesday. And I want each of you to come to class with one thing you like about the island of Utopia and one thing you don't like. And we will take it from there. Take care. Oh.